All right, so we all know Elon's plans to colonize Mars is ambitious, to say the least. To achieve this goal, SpaceX has got to reinvent all current technologies while also inventing new ones. Raptor engine is truly groundbreaking, but now its new generation is on a different level and unlike anything else. So, how did SpaceX redesign its new Raptor engine in a way that shocked everyone in the world? All is going to get revealed in today's episode of Alpha Tech. Stay right there. Before we get into today's content, we do want to tell you, first of all, thank you for watching these videos every day. Your support, just the view count, helps us stay motivated to keep making these videos for you. As far as subscribers, we're very close to the 100,000 mark. So if you do watch these videos regularly and you haven't done so already, we kindly ask that you press that subscribe button. On behalf of the channel owner, the writers, the video editors, the voiceover artists, we thank you so, so much for supporting our channel so that we can continue to create quality space news for space enthusiasts like you and us. All right, let's get into today's episode. The history of rocket engines can be traced back to 400 BC when a Greek Pythagorean named Archytas propelled a wooden bird along wires using steam. However, it was not powerful enough to take off under its own thrust. So we'll be focusing on engines developed to take people and objects into space. Goddard began to use liquid propellants in 1921 and by 26 became the first to launch a liquid propellant rocket. Stage combustion was first proposed by Alexei Isaev in 1949. The first stage combustion engine was the S-150-400 used in the Soviet planetary rocket designed by Malenikov, a former assistant to Isaev. About that same time, in 1959, Nikolai Kuznetsov began work on the closed-cycle engine NK-9 for Korolev's orbital ICBM GR-1. Kuznetsov later evolved that design to the NK-15 and NK-33 engines for the unsuccessful Lunar N-1 rocket. Meanwhile, in the West, the first laboratory stage combustion test engine was built in Germany in 1963 by Ludwig Bolikow. Liquid hydrogen engines were first successfully developed in the States. The RL-10 engine first flew in 62. Its successor, the rocket INJ-2, was used in Apollo's Saturn V rocket to send humans to the moon. The high specific impulse and low density of liquid hydrogen lowered the upper stage mass and overall size and cost of the vehicle. It's easy to see that many of the above engines were developed by state agencies. But as time went on, many more private companies joined the business. And they can even do it better. A great example of this is SpaceX's Raptor engine. In fact, it took SpaceX a few years and a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to make reusable rockets a feasible option. And now Falcon 9s are the industry standard for reusable rockets. With the success of Falcon 9 and Merlin engines, SpaceX decided to stick to a similar philosophy of reuse. When SpaceX said they'd reimagine rocket engine technology, they really did it. The journey to the current remarkable Raptor engine has been a long process of impressive developments by SpaceX. It wasn't by chance they were able to create such a clean, compact, and powerful Raptor engine. When designing and producing the Raptor, SpaceX always adhered to a famous saying by Elon. The best part is no part. The best process is no process. It weighs nothing, costs nothing. Can't go wrong. Raptor 1 was used in a suborbital test flight and on vehicles up to Booster 4 and Ship 20. The engine was still a prototype. It only had a thrust at 185 tons and was quite heavy, with the engine itself weighing 2,080 kilos and 3,630 kilos when all vehicle-related cargo and hardware got added. When transitioning from Raptor 1 to 2, we can see the overall design became a lot more streamlined and just simpler. Flanges were converted into welds, components like the heavy turbine machinery, combustion chamber, and nozzle and electronics all got redesigned, and parts like plumbing, torch igniters, and wiring were greatly reduced. Raptor 2 has since used Booster 7 and Ship 24. To date, it's the most mass-produced engine in Starship's program, with at least 569 engines made, and possibly more. The engine operates at 230 tons of thrust and is a lot lighter than Raptor 1. Specifically, Raptor 2 shed up to 1,630 kilos, making it 450 kilograms lighter than Raptor 1. With additional vehicle hardware, it weighs about 2,875 kilograms. Moving on to Raptor 3 now. This engine's a bit more sophisticated, with most of the external plumbing relocated inside or completely eliminated. Most of the internal plumbing consists of regenerative cooling channels integrated into the engine casing. This allows SpaceX to operate the engine at higher pressures and eliminate the heavy heat shield currently used on Raptor 2. The thrust of this engine is the highest at 280 tons, and it weighs 1,525 kilos or 1,720 kilograms with the additional vehicle components. Moreover, the removed parts were the most vulnerable during engine operation, so these upgrades help reduce a lot of risks, making the engine even more reliable. 
The engine's cost has also gone down significantly to around $2 million an engine, or even two hundred dollars with mass production, according to Elon's claims. But will this be the end of SpaceX's development path as they strive for even more perfection? Elon mentioned that the SpaceX engine's thrust should be increased to 300 to 335 tons an engine, which could be a 3X engine or a new version 4.0. This means 33 SpaceX Raptor engines will provide Starship with three times the thrust to Saturn V. In expendable mode, Starship will be capable of delivering 400 to 500 tons to orbit. The next major change to mention is the engine production capability. Before Raptor 2, SpaceX had been producing Raptor 1 for a while, from 2018 to the end of 2021. During that period, they made 100 Raptor 1 engines. This means that over more than three years, SpaceX took nearly two weeks to make one engine. By the end of 2021, SpaceX shifted to producing Raptor 2 engines. By 2022, after a year, they had produced 200 Raptor 2s. Thus, their engine production line had significantly gone down to about two days an engine. This was announced by Elon in a tweet in May of 2021. As of now, that time has been halved, meaning it only takes about 24 hours to make one engine. With the aforementioned upgrades in minimalist design, the advancements in making Raptor 3 are undeniable. Although we've only recently seen the Raptor engine version 3 with the serial number SN1, we can still speculate. If SpaceX could make one engine a day using the Raptor 2 design, then why couldn't they make multiple engines a day with this new design? If that becomes a reality, it'd be a feat never accomplished by any other engine. Of course, we're going to have to wait for official announcements on this, but what do you think? How many Raptor engines do you think SpaceX can make every day? Leave your predictions in the comments down below. And while we're talking about the Starship rocket being the next big improvement in commercial launch services, Raptor engine itself has got some groundbreaking hardware. Raptor also uses what's known as a full-flow stage combustion engine, only the third engine in history to employ this technique. A full-flow stage combustion engine refers to how a pump spins a turbine to drive the engine, used what's called a pre-burner to get this process going by injecting just a small amount of fuel. Now, normally, some of the propellants are expanded in a traditional open cycle engine to start this process, but Raptor is going to use every dropper of propellant available, making it one of the most efficient rocket engines ever built. This has been the holy grail of many rocket engine designers for quite some time. This design eliminates a lot of inefficiencies from previous generations of engines while simultaneously handling the crucial business of driving the fuel and oxidizer pumps efficiently without making up a lot of soot that would prevent the engine from getting reused without a bunch of extra work. It also eliminates a lot of seals between the oxygen and fuel pumps that are a common failure point in conventional engines, and it allows low-pressure pumps with a much higher pressure combustion chamber. Lowering the pressure in the pumps improves the engine life. Increasing the pressure in the combustion chamber allows for more thrust. The design goal is for the engine to be able to manage 1,000 flights, which is vastly better than anything else out there right now. SpaceX's Merlin is estimated to be able to handle between 10 and 100 launches. The space shuttle engines were good for about 7, and then and only then, with plenty of refurbishment. Another big win is that the engine is pretty small, which makes it possible to pack over 30 of them into the tail end of a super heavy booster, and that's necessary for what's soon going to be the world's largest rocket, heaviest spacecraft, with 150 tons and maybe 100 crew. The other is the use of methane. No methane-powered rocket has ever made it to orbit. With Starhopper's test top, SpaceX's Raptor is the first time a methane-powered rocket engine had actually taken flight. Methane prevents buildups of deposits in the engine compared to other fuels like kerosene, a process known as coking, while its higher performance allows for lower costs. Most previous rocket engines have relied on using fuels like kerosene in place of methane. But the main benefit of using methane is that it has a higher performance than other fuels, meaning the rocket's going to be smaller. Its lower cost, too, means the total cost of launching can go down. This could be crucial, because the number of Raptor engines SpaceX is looking to build right now is a lot. Not only that, Raptor's other major innovation over its predecessor is the use of methane, which harkens back to SpaceX's ultimate goal, establishing a city on Mars. According to industry analyst Caleb Williams from the consulting firm Spaceworks, you could reasonably easily extract methane from the Martian surface and potentially the lunar surface. In other words, SpaceX can in situ resource utilization. This is vital to SpaceX's goal of regular trips to and from Mars with Starship, allowing it to be the most self-sufficient in terms of fuel. So it could be considered the use of methane as the holy grail of establishing a self-sustaining city on Mars. And that's it for today's episode. Thanks for watching and hope to see you back here next time. Bye.